All right. Um, I think most people from the waiting room have joined us now. So welcome everyone to the third webinar we're hosting from our working group, which is on learning and education in citizen science. And um, yeah, we had one in September and now we're doing much better than last time. It was like a year in between the webinars and now it's just two months. So we think we <laughs> want to keep this up, but the next one won't be before January, February in the next year, but we're already looking for speakers. So let us know if you have something you'd like to share with the community. Um, just a quick um, round of house rules. We would ask you to please switch off your camera during the talks. Um, you are very welcome to raise your hand if you have questions, put them in the chat during the talks. We usually um, don't have that many participants that we um, need to keep you quiet. <laughs> um, so we would encourage you to ask your question after the talks um, if you want to, but we're also very happy to just read them out from the chat if you prefer it that way. Um, yeah, so today we have the pleasure of having two speakers, Maria Peter and Todd Powell, who will both talk about their um, PhD projects that they finished and successfully um, defended this year. So we're going to start with Maria. Um, and Maria is joining us from Spain today. And unfortunately, the camera is not working, but Maria is here and uh, will just briefly introduce herself before she talks about her research. Thank you, Julia. You can hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Hi, and um, welcome, everyone. I'm going to uh, let me first share my screen. Okay, where's it? No. There we go. Lovely. Yeah. Hi and welcome everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Maria. I worked at Kiel University and at the IPN, the Leibniz Institute for Science and Mathematics Education in Germany. And um, right now I'm on a sabbatical and as Julia said, I'm in, at the moment I'm in Spain trying to work on my Spanish language skills. And sorry for um, the camera seeing it seems that my internet is not good enough here so um yeah sorry but maybe next time it'll work better yeah you asked me what sparked my interest in citizen science i think part of it is that really um citizen science is so hands-on and i'm a pretty practical and hands-on person and citizen science is all about doing science not just reading or um, hearing about it i think that's one thing and and um, she also asked me about my favorite citizen science project. I have to say there are so many, I don't really have one. But what came to my mind first when I heard the question was the sea slug census in Australia, simply because sea slugs are amazingly beautiful. You should really Google it and um, have a look at the photographs. Yeah, now I would like to share with you some insights from my doctoral research on the participant outcomes and project characteristics of biodiversity citizen science projects. I'll start with a brief introduction to my research. I will then describe the theoretical background, my research questions, and the methods used to answer these questions. I will then present the main findings of my research, followed by implications for citizen science practice, and finally, a brief outlook. The introduction will be really quick. I just want to give you a short definition of biodiversity citizen science projects, a definition that I used in my research. Biodiversity citizen science projects are research projects that involve citizens or the public in identifying and monitoring biological diversity and collecting biodiversity data. And many citizen science projects or their leaders assume that these projects have outcomes on the side of the participants, such as gains in knowledge or changes in behavior, for example. And in my research, I wanted to find out whether that is really the case. Do citizens really learn about, for example, biodiversity through their participation in citizen science projects? For my research, I 
used two theoretical frameworks that address such participant outcomes of citizen science projects. These frameworks were developed by the research groups around Rick Bonney at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in the United States. The first framework developed by Jennifer Turk and her colleagues describes how project inputs and activities lead to outputs, outcomes and finally impact. What is relevant for us today is the section of the framework on outcomes for the individual participants. The second framework developed by Tina Phillips and her colleagues defines and describes such participant outcomes in a bit more detail. And the six outcomes for individual participants that she describes are knowledge of the content, process, and nature of science, social science inquiry, self efficacy for science and the environment, interest in and motivation for science and the environment, and finally behavior and search. As I said earlier, I wanted to find out um, whether biodiversity citizen science projects really achieve such outcomes. Let's assume they do, then it would also be useful to know how citizen science projects have to be designed if they are to contribute to participants' knowledge and skills and so on. Or in other words, what project design characteristics contribute to participant outcomes? Here again, this framework by Jennifer Turk is useful. It shows how project design characteristics in the framework originally referred to as activities lead to participant outcomes. When I started my PhD in 2016, there had been very little research on participant outcomes and pretty much no research on project characteristics. So I decided to investigate the following research questions. First, what are the outcomes of biodiversity citizen science projects on the side of the individual participating citizens? I broke the question down into two sub questions. What can we learn from citizen science a theory that is from past empirical research studies on the participant outcomes of citizen science projects? And what can we learn from citizen science practice that is from current citizen science projects and their participants? And research question two, to what extent are participant outcomes connected to the project design characteristics of these projects? In order to answer these questions, I conducted three consecutive research studies. I'll give you a brief overview of these studies. We will then focus on the third study. Number one, address the participant outcomes of biodiversity citizen science projects, and it consisted of a systematic literature review. Um, today, I'll not go into more detail. In study two, I conducted a broad study of biodiversity citizen science projects across projects and across countries and focal species. The study focused on the six participant outcomes described in the framework by Tina Phillips that we saw a few minutes ago. The study consisted of an international online survey of um, more than 1,000 participants of 63 different biodiversity citizen science projects. The participants were all adults who took part in their projects as volunteers. The survey contained mostly closed-ended questions about participants' perceived outcomes about the project and about their participation in the project and some open-ended questions for additional comments. In the third study, I investigated how the participant, out participant outcomes found in the second study were connected to project design characteristics in the study. In addition to the participant survey, I conducted an online survey of the project coordinators. In the coordinator survey, I asked the project coordinators about the infrastructure and implementation of the project, about information and training provided to the participants, about opportunities for interaction among participants and so on. I then combined the two data sets that resulted from the participant survey and the coordinator survey, which meant that in the end, I had a combined data set with responses from 48 coordinators and a bit more than 1,000 participants of the 48 projects. 
and I analyze these data quantitatively. Through this data analysis, <clears throat> excuse me, I, aid, I aim to answer the research question on participant outcomes and their connection to project design characteristics. Here I focus on two participant outcomes, that is on gains in knowledge and gains in skills. In my analysis, I focus on five specific project characteristics from the perspective of both project coordinators and project participants. These were information provided to and received by participants, training provided to and received by participants, opportunities for social interaction among participants, contact between project participants and project staff, and finally, feedback and recognition provided to and received by the participants. In this section, I will summarize the results of study two. We will then focus on study three in more detail. For the scientists among you, I will also provide some numbers, such as p-values and effect sizes. Now, if you're not into statistics, don't worry, just ignore these numbers. So in the second study, participants of current citizen science projects reported a variety of outcomes connected to biodiversity, the study showed that these projects achieved all six outcomes that were defined in the framework by Tina Phillips. That is gains in knowledge, skills, self-efficacy, interest, and motivation, and changes in behavior. In addition, survey respondents also described other participant outcomes that are not part of the framework. For example, increased health and well-being, and an increased connection to people and nature, but also if two negative personal outcomes. The third study showed that participants' gains in knowledge and skills were to a large degree related to the five project characteristics. These significant relationships were found mostly for project characteristics as described from the perspective of the participants. In the participant survey. That means that participants who received more information and more training and who interacted more with other participants and with public staff and scientists and who received more feedback and recognition also reported higher gains in both knowledge and skills. Let's now take a, look, a closer look at three of the project characteristics social interaction contact between project participants and project staff, and feedback received by the participants. First, we will look at social interaction among the participants. In the participant survey, I asked the project participants how often they communicated with other participants, for example, through email or on the phone or in person. The majority, or here 62%, responded that they never communicated with other participants. 24% communicated with other participants less than once a month, and 14% at least once a month. The data analysis revealed that project participants who did communicate with other participants reported significantly higher gains in biodiversity-related knowledge than participants who did not communicate with others. This applied to all the scales of knowledge, such as an increased awareness of species, an increased understanding of biodiversity, and increased learning about species, environment, and science. The same applied um, to gains in both data collection skills and skills beyond data collection, such as data analysis, etc. Effect sizes here in the right column were small to medium. I also asked participants whether they worked together with others when collecting data for the project. The majority of respondents, that is 60%, worked alone. Only 30% sometimes worked with others and 10% always collected data with others. For example, with family or friends or members of the same citizen science project. Here, data analysis show that participants who worked with others more frequently reported higher gains in skills. Effect sizes were small in this case. 
Next, I would like to talk about the amount of contact between project participants and project staff and scientists. I asked the project participants how often they communicated with project staff in general, for example, through email, phone, or in person. About 30% of respondents stated that they never communicated with project staff. 60% communicated with staff less than once a month and the remaining 10% communicated with staff once a month or more often. The analyses show that participants who had more contact with project staff generally also reported higher gains in both knowledge and skills with small effect sizes. Furthermore, participants reported how often they met the project scientists in person. 71% reported that they never met the scientists in person, 27% met the scientists less than once a month, and only 2% met them at least once a month. And then participants who met the project scientists more often also reported higher gains in knowledge and skills with small to medium effect sizes. Last but not least, feedback. I asked the participants how often they received individual feedback on their performance of project tasks. For example, feedback on whether they identified a species correctly. And most respondents had not received any feedback. 20%, 25% sometimes received feedback, 14% regularly, and 15% received feedback every time they submitted data. And again, it becomes clear that participants who received individual feedback more often reported significantly higher gains in both knowledge and skills. This applied to all subscales of knowledge and skills. Let's quickly summarize these results. We can say that both gains in knowledge and skills are significantly related to a range of project design characteristics. And also, there is very little research on the characteristics of citizen science projects. If existing studies do confirm the findings of this third study, and literature in formal education research also confirm the findings on, for example, feedback. However, and this was interesting for me to, to see in my research, um, the results that I just presented refer mostly to project characteristics as described by the participants in the participant survey. By contrast, the project characteristics as described by the coordinators in the coordinator survey hardly showed any significant connections to participants' gains in knowledge and skills. So there seems to be some discrepancy between participant and coordinator perspectives. And it would definitely be great, I think, to see some more research to shed some light on this. Now, what are the implications of my research, especially for citizen science practice and project design? First of all, it has become clear throughout my research that citizen science projects do have outcomes on the side of the participants, but these outcomes don't just simply happen. Rather, it's important to intentionally design the citizen science project for participant outcomes. And it's necessary to deliberately integrate features into the citizen science project to promote such participant outcomes. In the case of social interaction, be it among project participants or between project staff and participants, this means that it is necessary to provide opportunities for and actually um, actively encourage social interaction, for example, by offering regular activities for a certain target audience, for instance, activities that specifically address families, or by encouraging participants to collect data in pairs or teams, or by regularly providing participants with the opportunity to meet the project scientists in person. In the case of feedback, it's necessary really to provide participants with frequent and if possible immediate and individual feedback on their performance of project tasks. Other researchers found that one way of providing feedback in an efficient way is automated feedback when participants submit data online. To address these challenges of intentional project design for participant outcomes, it would be useful to include both natural and social scientists. 
um, right at the beginning when, when designing and developing citizen science projects and when the project is being implemented, staff that are specifically employed for community management could organize and promote, for example, interactions among participants or between project scientists and participants. I would like to end this presentation with a brief outlook. In my research, I focused on citizen science as a format in informal education, addressing adults. But citizen science could also be a useful format in formal education, addressing students. By bringing citizen science into formal um, education settings, such as a university or um, high school, for example, both sides could benefit. The students could benefit by learning about, for example, species and biodiversity. And citizen science projects could benefit by recruiting younger participants and by getting participants from a more diverse background than is currently often the case. One of the challenges would be, of course, to develop projects in such a way to make them suitable for um, schools and universities. However, one of the opportunities would also be that we could use the formal education setting for conducting further research on participant outcomes of citizen science projects. That's it from my side. I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, yeah, there weren't any questions in the chat that I saw. So just kind of an opportunity if you have any pressing questions that you want Maria to address now, you can raise your hand. I'm glad you're all still there because in between all the, all the pictures disappeared and I thought that maybe I was talking to myself. I'm oh, glad. no worries. No, no, no. <laughs> we were all here and listening. Just let me check the check, check the, the chat again. Of course, if there are questions later, um, feel free to send an email either to me directly or to the organizers and they can forward it to me. So I'm always happy to answer questions at any time. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, so we just continue with Todd's talk and then we'll have more time to discuss um, with Maria as well. Um, yeah, Todd is actually based at the west coast of the US. So um, he's the reason why we're here so late in the day for us Europeans. So thank you very much for um, getting up so early to share your research with us, Todd. Um, with Todd's area of research, it's not maybe as obvious as with Maria's why it is connected to education and learning. But the concept of science identity and identity development and the opportunities of citizen science being some kind of place or um, environment for identity work is quite interesting. And I think we as people engaged in education and learning um, have more learning to do here <laughs> in this um, sector. So we're very excited to have you with us and hear about your research, Todd. Great, thank you so much. Um, so yes, uh, good morning for me. I'm sipping coffee. Good afternoon and evening for all of you. You might have a different beverage in your hand, which I, I totally support. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right, is that showing up okay? Great. All right, so yes. Uh, thank you all for inviting me and having me today. Um, I'm going to be sharing a bit uh, similar to Maria about my uh, doctoral dissertation research. Um, again, not doing a deep dive, but just kind of uh, sharing some highlights from uh, the kind of two main study activities that I did, um, looking at the perspectives from practitioners, so citizen science uh, leaders, program coordinators, organizers, um, as well as perspectives of LGBTQ plus volunteers regarding how citizen science um, can and does uh, impact and develop uh, identities of volunteers. Before I jump into that, um, sharing a little bit more about kind of my background, where I'm at. Um, currently, I am a postdoctoral scholar at the Center for Community and Citizen Science at the University of California, Davis. Uh, I just started there last month working on an interesting 
interesting project, which is uh, exploring the role of community and citizen science in um, the Im implementation of marine protected areas across the state of California, as well as Oregon. Um, I pre prior to starting that doctoral position, I got my PhD at Oregon State University, where I conducted all of this work you're about to hear about. Um, what got me first uh, interested in or connected to citizen science was an opportunity with Conservation Volunteers Australia. I studied abroad during my undergraduate studies when I was focusing on marine science and um, kind of signed up for a weekend trip with this organization and got to go out into the field in northern Queensland and collect some data on invasive species, um, uh, invasive vegetation. It was, yeah, really interesting. And in terms of one of my favorite citizen science projects, uh, Spiral Graph. It's really fun just taking photographs of galaxies and trying to identify and uh, uh, ascribe spirals to those. It's uh, and I, something I've done in the past with students in courses I've taught, um, a kind of easy in the classroom citizen science contributory project, which has been really exciting. All right, so now getting into an overview of my work, uh, just to kind of ground where I'm coming from. Um, as most of us all know, citizen science as a field of practice and citizen science as a field of research has come a long way in recent years. And we're really seeing a shift in kind of the avenues of research and what we're looking at. And there's this kind of uh, recent push to look more to the volunteers themselves, as we heard from Maria, looking at um, the outcomes for the volunteers, as well as kind of um, looking a little bit deeper into understanding the individual as well as collective complexities uh, that kind of get at, you know, who these folks are, why they're participating, as well as what they get out of participating, uh, which is really fascinating. And by kind of looking at these, um, by considering aspects of volunteers' identities that creates the potential for um, practitioners to improve how they engage with volunteers, as well as how they approach project development and design in order to not only produce, uh, you know, great scientific outcomes, but uh, great participant outcomes as well, and especially helping to develop science identities of those folks engaging in the um, project activities. So kind of situating the study goal, um, citizen science has been identified as a mechanism to support the um, identity development of individuals, not just science identities, but also social and cultural identities, especially for folks from uh, non-dominant backgrounds or communities in STEM. And there are some um, previous studies out there about underrepresentation in citizen science based on a, a variety of identities and backgrounds, uh, but there's actually not a lot out there about experiences uh, for LGBTQ plus identifying individuals that engage with citizen science. So the, the goal of my research is um, kind of twofold. So to explore and understand how citizen science engagement contributes to um, science identity development of volunteers from the perspective of practitioners, and then uh, also focusing on from the experiences of LGBTQ plus volunteers how engaging with those opportunities have contributed to their science identity development and the relationships between their science identities and queer identities. Uh, so how I'm defining science identity when I'm talking about it in this context, um, it's kind of a, a broad definition used by a lot of folks in this field, although I know there are many different uh, ways of conceptualizing this. But um, for this study, I considered uh, how an individual sees themselves and is recognized by others as someone who understands, uses, and does science. So uh, this study was conducted in two phases. The first one, I uh, did an online international survey of citizen science practitioners. So again, those are folks that lead, coordinate, organize, oversee any aspect of a citizen science project um, broadly defined. And then in phase two, I conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, self-identifying LGBTQ plus citizen science volunteers. Uh, and I'll get into more about the questions that were involved in each of those phases here in a bit. So we'll start off looking at the survey work. Um, some of you might have seen my recruitment emails uh, about this time last year, maybe a little more than a year ago, um, to uh, provide some input on how your projects or programs 
uh, contribute to science identity development of volunteers. So for the survey, um, the aim was to identify the extent and methods by which citizen science practitioners consider that their projects approach the development of volunteer science identities, um, as well as how their projects um, address topics related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. So the research questions leading this, uh, you can see here, to what extent and in what ways do citizen science practitioners perceive their projects address science identity development of volunteers? And uh, how do citizen science practitioners perceive their projects engage with topics related to DEIA? So as I mentioned earlier, I did an online uh, survey um, that had uh, open-ended questions as well as uh, Likert type items related to the construct of science identity, um, as well as a couple of open and closed questions related to DEIA. Um, it was a wide international recruitment. I tried to share the survey with any and all citizen science networks, listservs, forums, you name it. Um, and then the data were analyzed both quantitatively and qualitatively uh, with descriptive statistics and frequencies for the closed items and then um, qualitative open thematic coding for the open response questions. All right, so who took the survey? Um, even though there were over 120 attempted responses, I got 49 complete responses from individuals from 49 different projects across the globe. Uh, the vast majority were from the US um, with a few from uh, Australia, Austria, Panama, Slovenia, Spain, and the UK. Um, in terms of project formats or models, uh, about 23 of the 49 were a contributory volunteer engagement model. So basically volunteers just collecting um, or contributing data. Um, 88% of those projects uh, were uh, in-person or field-based with uh, a smaller percentage being a uh, hybrid followed by 100% uh, online. And then in terms of the geographic scale or range that the projects encompass, 19 had a state or regional focus um, with 11 in uh, local communities and then a few uh, international and then at the national scale. All right, so jumping into the results related to the um, Likert items, these are the um, six Likert items that I included related to the construct of science identity. Um, and you can see most of them generally skew towards um, agreeing um, with the exception of the fourth one, which is negatively worded. So it should be noted um, that that is indicating more agreement, even though it's got the larger red bar. Um, the kind of result here on this slide that I wanted to point out is um, the last item here. So the statement was our projects volunteers consider themselves to be scientists. And we can see here there's a bit more variability in responses. 44% um, indicated neither, uh, which could also indicate that they, they weren't sure. Um, and I'll kind of revisit this later when I talk about recommendations for practice, but um, even though the item above it indicates that practitioners or the projects consider the volunteers' actions to be doing science, uh, the practitioners themselves aren't sure if the, the volunteers are seeing it that way as well. So there's a bit of a disconnect there, um, which is something interesting to, that I'll comment on in a bit. But um, largely the practitioners indicated that um, in these different ways, um, intentionally aiming to develop science identities, acknowledging diversity of cultures, backgrounds, and experiences of volunteers, uh, acknowledging volunteers' actions and contributions as doing science, um, the, uh, recognizing the scientists or the volunteers as scientists, it's, it's a largely agree. So they largely feel that their projects are doing these things, which ultimately contribute to developing science identities. Um, in terms of the open response questions, I asked uh, what, how did, in what ways, if any, does your project's mission goals and or objectives address science identity? And then in what ways, if any, does your project promote science identity development of volunteers? So kind of looking at it from the uh, organizational, is it ingrained in like how you aim to approach your project in kind of uh, the way it's structured? Um, and then more formally in the actual actions and activities that you do. Uh, within your projects, are you promoting science, uh, science identity development? Um, so the results of the uh, open response items, uh, you can see the far left column, these are kind of the overarching themes. Um, so acknowledgement, recognition, and feedback, um, the personal and social dimensions of volunteer engagement, contributing to project design and research or management, 
and then increase scientific knowledge, literacy, and skills, and then none or indirectly. Um, so you can see the, the theme that had the most um, occurrences was this fourth one down here, increased science, knowledge, literacy, and skills. So again, most practitioners perceive their projects contribute to developing science identities via that kind of education avenue. So um, developing the volunteer scientific skills, scientific understanding, um, and education surrounding whatever the, the topic or focus of their project may have been. Uh, here's an example uh, quote from the open response related to the theme of personal and social dimensions. Uh, we encourage all in current and potential volunteers to develop healthy self-reflected narratives within themselves that foster both personal and professional growth. We can support them on their journey towards building self-reliance, self-confidence, and self-advocacy. Um, so getting kind of at that uh, more broadly uh, ingrained aspects of personal dimension or other facets of identity um, beyond just uh, science identity or uh, science learning or education outcomes. And then looking at the DIA uh, a results, so again, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. To what extent do projects uh, discuss or address these themes or topics? Um, and you can see, uh, it kind of varied with 20% uh, never, 16 rarely, 31 occasionally, 20% a moderate amount, and 13% a great deal. And then I also asked, in what ways does your project intentionally recruit and engage a diversity of volunteers and left an open response for uh, pr practitioners to elaborate on how their projects engage with uh, these topics and themes. And you can see again the far left column were kind of the themes that emerged from those open response items. Uh, interestingly, the one that had the most occurrences was none barriers or as needed, um, which was very informative uh, given that practitioners acknowledged that there could be more that they are doing or they considered it to be a work in progress. Um, but ultimately, there were a lot of things standing between them and their projects from uh, moving forward in this area of working around the concepts and constructs of DEIA. And then uh, an example from the theme of acknowledging plans for improvement, we're in the process of reviewing content for accessibility. We underwent a review to see how, we, how well we meet different learning styles and have implemented recommendations multiple, to provide multiple ways of getting critical information. Um, and then just some general recommendations for practice stemming from this first phase related to um, the survey of practitioners. So reinforcing the notion that volunteers are scientists and are doing contributing to science. So practitioners letting the volunteers know that that's how they are being seen and treated and um, that the volunteers should consider themselves that way as well. Creating feedback loops between practitioners and uh, volunteers, involving volunteers in the project design uh, or research design process, employing multiple methods and formats of engagement and communication, um, both among volunteers themselves, as well as between uh, volunteers and practitioners, and making concerted efforts to recruit, engage, and support volunteers from non-dominant backgrounds, cultures, and communities. All right, <clears throat> so now I'm going to kind of shift into phase two, the interviews I conducted with LGBTQ plus uh, citizen science volunteers. Um, the overall aim was to understand the personal dimensions of citizen science volunteer engagement, uh, mainly focusing on the relationships between their science and queer identities, with the kind of overarching research question about uh, generally what's the relationship between LGBTQ plus identifying citizen science volunteers, science and queer identities. Um, so kind of a, a note on terminology. So queer is a, a broad umbrella term for anyone that um, may identify as a sexual orientation or gender identity minority outside of kind of the cisgender heterosexual norm. Uh, queer can also be used as a verb, which means to challenge or disrupt, uh, especially social norms. Um, mostly for this, I'm talking about it in the umbrella term, but you'll see um, there are a few examples where I use it as the verb form. Um, all of my participants were asked how they felt about this term because not everyone is a fan of this term and it does have negative connotations and uh, some historical uh, derogatory usage, um, but all participants were comfortable uh, using the term and they all identified as possessing a queer identity. 
So uh, again, a very broad recruitment um, through listservs, networks, emails, uh, social media, which is very helpful. Um, and then data collected in one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interviews via Zoom. Um, I'll share an, an overview of the general questions that were asked. And then this, they were analyzed uh, qualitatively through an open coded thematic coding process, similar to the one for the open response items from the practitioner survey. So the key interview questions related to identity that I asked were what sort of role does your queer identity play in your day-to-day -day life? Um, so beyond the scope of engaging with citizen science. And then I specifically asked, how has your queer identity impacted your participation in citizen science? Uh, how do you view the relationship between science broadly and queerness? And then what aspects of culture, family background have contributed to your engagement with science uh, broadly or citizen science specifically? And so this is an overview of the wonderful 14 participants that uh, engaged with my study and that uh, spent a lot of time talking with me about. Um, despite international recruitment, they were all based in the US. Um, I had a demographic survey um, to make sure folks met eligibility, which is basically self-identify as LGBTQ and have uh, volunteered with any sort of citizen science project, at least within the past year. Um, and then I tried to do some um, purposeful sampling to get a good diversity of participants based on um, ages, gender and sexual identities, as well as race and ethnicities. And then, so the three main themes that emerged uh, from these uh, in interviews were the impacts of queer and personal connections on um, science and queer identities, the opportunities for queering scientific approaches. So um, again, that verb form of queer, so disrupting or challenging or innovating as well. And then persisting barriers for queering slash uh, queers in citizen science. Um, and that's citizen science specifically, as well as kind of science more broadly, which uh, a lot of the participants did mention. Um, I'll give a few examples from each of these three main themes, um, but won't spend a lot of time diving into the kind of overview of each of them. Um, so again, this is the first theme, impacts of queer and personal connections. And then in the left column, kind of the sub themes. Um, so mentions of family, friendships and relationships, uh, seeing citizen science as a queer space, um, no queer impact at all. So a lot of people are eight, folks uh, didn't see much of a relationship between their queer identities and their engagement in citizen science, and then the um, influences of school and education. Um, so an example of the, the friendships and relationships sub theme. Um, so Penguin, a 72 year old white bisexual woman shared, it was through the community garden association. I was in charge of monitoring emails and one day got an email from a woman that said she and her same sex partner were moving here and wanted to be in the association. And so we started corresponding and they're now my best friends. So they were able to connect not only uh, through their engagement with uh, a citizen science adjacent opportunity like a community garden, uh, but also based on the kind of commonality of identifying as LGBTQ plus and have uh, forged strong relationships in, since then. So looking at the second theme of opportunities for querying scientific approaches, um, the sub themes column, uh, identities impact science and scientists, uh, opportunities to queer science. So again, to challenge or disrupt science, um, queer approaches to citizen science, uh, citizen science as a querying tool, and then the queer benefits of science. And an example quote from the theme, the sub theme of queer approaches to citizen science, um, David, a 38 year old white gay and queer man shared um, the number of times I got told that we were making grinder for trees, which um, those of you that may not be familiar, grinder is a gay dating app based on geolocation, um, which is uh, largely used by uh, gay men. Um, so the number of times I got told we were making grinder for trees, and this was in the early days, I heard of this dating app, it kind of sounds like what you're doing. I'm not going to lie, I think that kind of community making, if we can call it that, or that kind of low risk way of interacting with other people might have tacitly shaped the way I thought about that platform, that there would be a way for a way online for people to care about trees to connect with one another and let each other know what they're doing without having to meet in person because they might not want to. Yeah, I think that might have bubbled up in there somewhere. So here he's referring to a citizen science app that he developed for tree identification. 
um, based on geolocation that allowed people to um, interact and connect um, and uh, making the connection that perhaps his experience using Grindr had subconsciously <laughs> influenced his uh, approach to developing that app. And then the third theme, persisting barriers for queering or queers in citizen science, um, sub themes, traditional science norms, lack of connection in the closet and power structures in citizen science. Um, an example of the lack of connection sub theme was shared by Motai, a 62 year old American Indian white two spirit asexual lesbian individual. Um, she shared, there's nothing to bond with. My experiences are so different from theirs. And here she's talking about uh, a lack of connection with her fellow volunteers that were based in a small community-based citizen science project. Um, their only uh, commonality was engaging in the citizen science project, but beyond that, uh, she felt rather isolated and like there was a lack of connection uh, because she didn't have anything to bond with beyond just the interest in that specific citizen science project. And then uh, recommendations for practice resulting from these interviews were um, encouraging and facilitating relationship building, not just among the volunteers themselves, but again, between the practitioner and volunteer um, kind of groups. Creating welcoming spaces for queer folks. So um, going beyond just sharing pronouns, um, creating partnerships with LGBTQ plus organizations or communities, um, acknowledging and validating queer identity perspectives and approaches and how these can be an asset to um, doing science, especially doing citizen science, having uh, kind of these queer innovative approaches can be a, a benefit to uh, how people approach doing science. Building off mutual areas of interest and concern, promoting social interactions and connections, again, not just uh, among the volunteers, but um, with the practitioners as well, uh, through a variety of uh, opportunities and platforms, and then practicing inclusive um, and participatory project and program design. And then just the general conclusions from across the, the two phases of my study, um, the importance of creating connections, again, uh, twofold within the volunteer community, as well as between practitioners and the volunteers. Um, queering citizen science, so again, not just making uh, citizen science a queer friendly space or not just practitioners showing that they're open to welcoming queer folks, but also acknowledging that queer perspectives and queer experiences uh, can be an asset to doing science and doing citizen science. And then uh, barriers and opportunities. So uh, it's important for practitioners to acknowledge what the barriers may be, but then propose solutions to um, tackle those barriers for engaged LGBTQ plus citizen science volunteers, but uh, folks from all types of non-dominant backgrounds and communities in STEM, as well as uh, be more inclusive in um, how you approach project and research design. So engaging volunteers in that process and having their input and their perspectives inform uh, activities from the outset. And that is um, kind of an overview of my spiel. Um, Something I just wanted to note is um, another aspect of my work looked at a, a sense of community as a construct as well. So some of the recommendations and conclusions there were related to that. So um, kind of some interesting overlaps between the personal dimension and the social dimension um, of identity versus uh, community and community building. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Todd, and thank you, Maria, earlier on as well. Um, totally different um, perspectives, totally different um, topics, but really, really interesting. Um, yeah, just so thank you both so much for sharing that. That's been so just a totally fascinating evening um, for me. 